Cookies, the world's most influential basketball podcast. Everybody's saying it. Andrew Quo, what is going on? It's Monday morning. It's muggy. It's New York City and the end of July. Are you already in vacation mode? I've been in vacation mode, man. I haven't I haven't worn real pants in a long time. Basketball shorts, borderline real, right? Uh, a lot of a lot of boxers in the house. A lot of not going out. Yo, it's. I know weather talk is not the talk, but that's all I think about is the weather. You and my mom, really, a lot of weather chat coming my direction from you from you pair. Can we do an updated 2024 forbidden conversations? We got weather, how much money you make, um, how much you weigh, um, Michael Jordan as a goat. Um, mm. What else do we have? Oh, Jalen Brunson as New York City mayor. Mm, Tatum All NBA. Can we still talk about that? That's a conversation I love to have. Mm. This is the foundations of the perfect pod. What are you doing? That's, that's all we're talking about. That's right. <laughs> there's really, there's really nothing else. <laughs> yeah. Halliburton season. What well, one? One illicit activity. It's not necessarily a conversation, Andrew. Have you seen this going around? They're saying that straight men don't read novels. Wow. Well, I don't have to display my straightness any more than the chrome danglers, the chrome soup dumpling danglers on my cyber truck. But what is what does gendering illiteracy mean? As someone who strongly believes that all reading is sus. Except for the joy of basketball, which is required. So I, I guess this idea that straight men don't read novels is that men love facts. Straight uh, men. They don't care about your whimsy. Or your, mm, I your, have a your, friend your, like your, your fictional yeah. characters that you're inventing and telling stories about. They just want to learn about World War II. How could he be Dr. Doom if he was already Iron Man? I don't understand. I hear this. I have a friend who, like, sadly, with much shame, reads like three books a week. Oh. And yeah, and they're all nonfiction. And well, it's a part of their job, whatever. But um, we've had conversations about this for decades, just being like, he's just like, I don't like scripted movies. I don't like novels. I don't like made up stories. I don't really have time for that because there's so much good nonfiction to throw into my eyeballs. I kind of hear what he's saying, but to genderize it is confusing to me. I think what he's saying is in his interests rely what lies in like truth and bias and untruths, right? And if nothing is provable, he's just not interested in it. So if you're like, this guy is a billionaire and he's got a, a, his superpowers are armor that shoots rockets. He's like, well, that's for children. What about the guy who trades guns and owns the New York Nets for 10 years? As someone who has sex with women, <laughs> I would like to read about the... Origins of bronze. I mean, the frustrating thing is, it's like, okay, I'm going to read an article this week. What's New York Magazine got? What's the New Yorker got? The New Yorker is like one of the last vestiges of like poetry and and like fiction in that way. They always have a short story in their magazine, which is kind of wonderful. But that is a section I do skip over for a later date. And then you're like, okay. Well, right. Well, yes, because you enjoy pendulous boobs. Um, mm -hmm. And therefore, pendulous. prefer, yeah. prefer, yes. damn, that's like a pendulum. And therefore, you prefer to read about Winston Churchill. Scrambling to hide my two cat. Cover up that litter box. <laughs> um, but like, you ever decide you're taking a dump? 
you're you're on a job. You're a task rabbit. You know, times are tough. It's twenty twenty four. You're you're an exterminator. You yeah. head into rid the premises of, of roaches or other vermin, and you immediately take a quick detour to drop the deuce of your life. You're New York City Mayor Eric Adams, the rat czar. You're taking the biggest shit in the morning <laughs> of your morning, and you open up the New Yorker, and you're like, I'm going to read some nonfiction. It's like, ah, oh, the knife sharpeners of Asia, and you're like, motherfucker. <laughs> I'm going to have to read a made-up story now. <laughs> Oh, the fiction issue hits hits different. <laughs> yeah. It's always got a beach scene on it. It's double. It's, uh, like, do you think documentaries are more ethical than dragon dragon shows? Mm, no, no. I, I don't I don't have this problem with nonfiction. I don't either, but I understand the the grievance. Because there's something high in mind. I get on my high porcelain horse when I read, <laughs> when I watch a documentary. You know what I mean? Oh, I'm learning shit and taking. I, I, no, I, I understand that 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 concept. I'm with you on that, but it's also like, well, I don't listen to music. I listen to podcasts. Podcast. Hopefully, perfect podcasts. Um, I've. This is a, but music. It's all made up. They're just making things up. They're making up melodies and notes, tunes. This lyrics. is a sneaky topic that I somehow have like a lot of feelings about. I'm um, discovering in real time. I've been trying to listen to more music for like you know how some people like read for twenty minutes. Weird people are like read for twenty minutes, mm -hmm. or someone's like meditate mm -hmm. for an hour. Uh, Don um, Mark Wahlberg, right? It's like I meditate from five a.m. to eight a.m. <laughs> <laughs> in the darkness, snoring. Um, but I try to listen to music because too much of my brain is full of like BPM, Kamala Harris polling, health stuff, seed oils. After a while, well, I want to. Well, you're 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 a straight man. It's it's full of facts, figures. Yeah, and then this is where I let my freak flag fly, my LGBTQI plus flag fly. I listen to some Kendrick Lamar, never some eh, Drake sometimes, but I I, pro like, I I browse playlists and think about things I haven't heard in a while. And I've reconnected with like a couple friends who are doing the same thing, and um, it's awesome. It's like a different part of my brain. I feel happy when I listen to like sad music. It's cool. So you just introduced yourself to Xavier So Based. And yeah, that's right. You're living your best life. Yeah. Well, like, well, some prosecutors would claim rap music is doc a documentary and they can be found liable for the things that they brag about. But. It is the CNN of the ghetto, as yeah. they say. But, like, I, for my day job, whatever, what I do mostly is, like, I try to live in the world of make-believe and not, like, superheroes, not, like, the boys or that show or anything, but I try to think about stuff that isn't tethered to, like, news or facts or whatever. Um, and if I lose any kind of foothold there which I always do it like it, it makes it harder so I always try to stay goofy for me nonfiction is a way to get excited about writing mm. uh, I'm sorry I, I mean fiction sorry nonfiction it's like yes you are absorbing information and it's making you ostensibly smarter just go read a book any book mm-hmm <laughs> Uh, I got this Adolf Hitler guy. So, uh, he, he he put out a, a manuscript. Should I take a read? Mein Kampf. Does that translate to my couch? Is this a love story? But but I, I like fiction because it's more stylized. And mm, I think nonfiction a is a little more nuts and bolts. And I'm not saying there aren't differences between writers of Wh nonfiction. Of course there are. Which nuts? Of course. Truck nuts. These nuts. But there, 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 are, there are obviously differences. But fiction is just wholly stylized in so many different ways. So I, I like it from a writing standpoint just to get excited about being creative and writing with 
more of a flourish, even though The Joy of Basketball obviously is nonfiction. Uh, there are fictional elements. That's flow- It's a flowery as hell book, man. That's There's what I mean. It's like it's everywhere. It, it's I would say it's it's written more the spirit of fiction because you know it's based on a true story. Right. Basketball. I mean, there's the play-by-play announcer, and then there's the person who adds the color. And that's what we do over here, Ben. But uh, you make a good Absolutely. point, right? Like, I think one of the secrets of making creative things is to find what you like first, but then steal what you like. And, uh, you know, there's Fred again, a very popular DJ now. He tells this story over and over about um, being under the wing of Brian Eno and Eno just giving him like a, a million a, f- a few hundred files of like doodles that he's created throughout the years and he's like take any one of these doodles and make a song out of it just take what I made for you gave you and just make it your own because everything starts from somewhere else and to create something from nothing is possible but is also very difficult and may not give you what you want. Just like steal a little bit here and there. This is the Jasper Johns thing, right? Yeah, I, I think that's true. I mean, even when someone writes in a style that's completely different from my own, you know, we're talking like, like, I don't know, Cormac McCarthy or something. It's like completely different. You can still appreciate what he's doing and think of, the way that sentences could work together or word choices and things like that. Mm -hmm. It's like you can absolutely borrow from someone that is wholly different in every way and and every genre and whatever. I mean, even in like basketball terms, like you could look at two players who are totally different, like Shaq and Steph Curry. Like you could figure out something from the other one, the way they moved, even if no one would compare the two. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's why there's, Slight disappointments from my Lakers hater ass. Like, Kobe just reminds me of Jordan. So I'm just like, oh, I know the provenance of this thing. Wonderful player, to be honest, you know. But, like, the provenance is there, and I understand it. But right to your point, it's like when I saw Shaq, I'm like, ooh, the Jordan connection is the one, the conversation I want to have because they have, they certainly have similarities. Yeah, and I think the more obvious ones are like, okay, Kobe's going to go work with Akeem. And now, you know, LeBron's going to work with Akeem. Mm. And now someone and so is going to work with Akeem. And Dwight Howard. And this, but that sort of legatial element of the dream shake. And Cooper Flag's going to work with Keith Van Horn. Like, duh. <laughs> <laughs> no shit. The, 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 the KV-8 shake is now <laughs> That's right. taking over the whole league. <laughs> No, for sure. And, you know, like, this gets into territory of, like, what what do you call this kind of homage or thought process? Like, is it postmodern? Is it after postmodern? Is it modern, you know? And, like, I, I don't think you can... People have been trying to recreate churches architecturally for generations. Maybe to more but probably to less effect because the original Notre Dame or whatever is is the thing you think about when you think about writing. And there was something, or uh, religion, and there was someone talking about on my Twitter feed about like Ulysses. It's like every motherfucker's telling me to read this book. It sucks. It is impo- I'm 400 <laughs> pages in and I do not what's, know what's going on. And I'm like, right. I remember my father being like, you just have to read the Bible. It, we're not religious. We're not a religious family. I'm not pushing you there. But like a lot of the secrets, the secret sauce is in this book with other stories. So you're going to read your comic books. I was a young dude. You're going to read your comic books and be like, that was crazy story of betrayal. And he's like, it's from the Bible. So eventually in your life, read it. Never did. Never will. How about so that, like, Dad? I'm like, hey, what do you think about the burning bush? And you're like, whatever, man. <laughs> we talking about a roots band? What are we doing? Um, <laughs> that ethical king, Dave Matthews? <laughs> yeah, that movie, Passion of the Christ by Mel Gibson? Um, 
No, I, and I wish I did. Like my dad used to read uh, Moby. Well, every summer he used to say, every year I try to have a number one American book on the rankings, and he would read everything over and over. So he would read Moby Dick, Sound and Fury, uh, and alternate between those two books my whole life. So he'd be like, this summer I think. I think Moby Dick takes it. It's the better novel. Melville is the better writer. And then he'd be like, <laughs> scratch that. Faulkner touched on something really specific. As I get older, I'm appreciating that more. That's the number one book. I read both of them. I get more choked up thinking about Jeremy Lin than those damn books. So you're saying, like, Dick Boy is not up. <laughs> I mean, I'm a man. Faulkner, Falk, I'm a Faulkner man. Boy is down bad? Well, oh God, those I've read both those books. The Faulkner one I have trouble with because it's so stylized that I yeah. kind of get lost in like letters and words. I start just like looking at word forms, and I'm like, I can't do this. My brain can't go there. And Moby Bit Dick is so full of nothing that I'm like, that am I dead? Am I am I walking this Elysian Fields dead? Reading this book where nothing happens. Mm-hmm. Am I the white whale? I mean, that is the question. Queequeg in the um, X-Files. Well, I, I think the gendered part is interesting because those books that you mentioned are written by men. They're masculine. They're part of this masculine lineage of novels. And this idea that straight men read nonfiction is kind of just based on them, like boomer dads. But weren't and people adopting. Dads Hemingway fans? Like, didn't they love but, that shit? Right, but it's almost like they've ad- adopted this thing of, no, I'm just going to read about lawnmowers. That's a man's book right there. A book about lawnmowers? For sure. <laughs> I'm with them. <laughs> I'm sorry the, to bust it. Yeah, I'm with them. The history of the grill. How to kill rats. I'm like, ooh, that's a manly <laughs> shit. I'm a rat but, it, it, but, yeah, right, reading Hemingway... And oh, bullfights, sangria. Yeah, yeah, this is some man shit. Like, oh, no, 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 no. And tried a book about charcoal grills. <laughs> I mean, we lived in an era where that masculinity is kind of like hazy, right? Because like bullfighting and like late night drinking of whiskey, I'm just like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Easy there. You know, like that is not entirely like the straightest thing thankfully because they're wonderful enjoyable things but like you know we grew up with the bear show and bears in general right like they're Hemingway fans I so assume. you're saying that like sangria and bullfighting is a little too flamboyant for your manly taste well don't boomers make European traditions and southern American traditions all kind of gay compared to like AR-15s <laughs> right like that's the, the stupidity of J.D. Vance that yeah, we're it, gonna drink wine all night and we're gonna watch bullfights like okay gay lord I mean ever go into an Applebee's and order a red wine <laughs> <laughs> sangria that's the drink with the fruits in it yeah I ordered a vodka that brandy soda. you having brand, brandies with little bits of apple and oranges I went, yeah, I went into a dive bar this summer, ordered a, a vodka soda, and the bartender was like, okay, okay, novel boy. <laughs> I'm like, dude, okay, I accept it. That's awesome, whatever. I like my drinks refreshing and to pack a punch and not have a, a carb overload every time. Sheesh. Bullfighting, the thing with the, the, the red cape. I mean, it's kind of a dance, isn't it? Like, there's paintings of bullfighters. There's songs, beautiful songs about bullfighters. Like Those pants look pretty billowy there, uh, senor. There are Americans who think soccer is kind of sus. I'm like, what the? F- longest tradition organized sports ever. Soccer? Uh, footy, I mean. Hey, Have listen. you ever read about D-Day? They got to get behind a... A candidate who fucks couches. So it's really confusing on that side. Great transition. Let's talk about your man. He is kind of my JD man. Vance. I, He's kind of your man. Look, I, he writes nonfiction. 
That's he's right. A, he's stra- well, straight as an arrow, that guy. It's kind of, he claims a lot of it is fictionalized. Like, he didn't actually fuck the couch. But I, he is my man in the way that, like, I was burnt <laughs> out on politics, man. I hate this, like, toxic masculinity we have with <laughs> Trump and Biden. Finally, J.D. Vance <laughs> shows up, a softer side of politics. He's talking about loving inanimate objects. Something, I love ideas. I fall in love with thoughts. He falls in love with sectionals. He said that well, Andrew. <laughs> so I, I think JD Dan, JD, JD Dance, uh, but JD Vance. There is a, a part of me that has sympathy for this wholly unsympathetic character, only in that his origin mythology is interesting to me because you see these photos of him wearing a Mao t-shirt or you hear about how he you know talks with alt-right people on their discord channel I'm like this guy's such a fucking nerd yes and somewhere he turned into this evil nerd right. he was anti-Trump and now he obviously is Trump's running mate at some point he was like this young conservative at Yale from a working class background reading Andrew Sullivan and the, the, the conservative blogosphere. He's this odd creation where people said that bad reviews of Hillbilly Elegy are what spurred him into politics. Like there's this oddity about him. He, he has a, an Indian wife and he was talking about her the other day and she's like she's not white but it's crazy neo-nazis were like but he's married to someone of color and he's like listen listen that may be true but she's a really good mom <laughs> we're like how is a writer this bad with words insane he says so many dumb things <laughs> but there's i a, love it there's, i love it but part of it it's also really funny the video yeah of him backstage <laughs> It's like there's a bunch of crap here, <laughs> like, like Mountain Dew, Mountain some Dew. Snickers bars. Like yeah. I don't know, maybe you guys could donate some money or something. I'll blimp it's out like, if for, I eat this stuff. Yeah, it's like I'm just gonna totally get fat as shit. <laughs> um, if I drink this Mountain Dew that you're gonna call me racist for doing. Like he's such a putz. I would like to stand for JD Vance. Not only has he given me more energy and enthusiasm for politics than I've had before. <laughs> I respect him because he's pushing, he's, he's trying to run from those extra 20 pounds like his life depended on. This dude <laughs> is not in the body that he was meant to be in. And I'm a Death Cab for Cutie fan. I like Postal Service. I know this body type. He is Ben Gibbard to a T. All he does is talk about like diet sodas and like his frustrations with looking at like Halloween size Snicker bar. He's like, there must be 11 here. I'm like, they're baby size, bro. You can eat four of those. But um, yeah, I, I, I respect his fallibility. It's refreshing and I'm glad he's not on the Knicks. I like this idea that he's fleeing his, his body type though. Oh yeah. Because that's true. Like, you're John Popper, my friend. <laughs> Yo, where is Blues Traveler? Shout out to John Popper. Is he alive? He died, right? Is he with Danny Ainge making deals? Is, is he with Chub Rock? <laughs> I mean, that would make more sense. I don't know if John Popper is alive or not. I'm Googling it. I mean, I have not heard about mm, Blues Traveler in a while. I feel like he might have died. Uh, I would say, or is he skinny as fuck now? Yo, motherfucker's 57 and kicking. He's mm, I, he's mm. younger than Obi Toppin? Just, <laughs> that's Buddy Heald's age. <laughs> yeah. He's 5'10". He can, he can be a 3 and D wing. Chicken wing. No, yeah, no, Vance, no. Is, Vance is supposed to be poppered out, and he's not. But you can tell, right? Because there's like... Footage of him fucked, and I don't want to body shame. I know we're in the era of Ozempic, but like I respect the king who's fighting his own reflection. That is like, that's some novella shit right there. So, do you think that your man J.D. Vance 
is going to get replaced in this ticket because the story of how he was decided upon seems to be reliant on the Trump children who are, <laughs> That's right. are unlikely to make a strong choice, but they were apparently insistent. Like, no, no, it's Vance, it's Vance, it's Vance. And they, they argued everyone down and they got Vance and now he's a laughing stock. And, uh, and Trump is tuned in. He's online. He, he knows about these jokes about the couch. Fuck. What, what the fuck is this? He's fucking couches. Like, and he's old enough that he believes everything that he hears, even if he calls it lies. Or the Trump kids were like, he's the perfect candidate for you. He's racist. He hates women. He hates cats. He only reads nonfiction. But he fucks couches. And Trump's like, who doesn't? And they're like, okay, we're good. <laughs> they have a golden toilet like J.J. Reddick? <laughs> um, how can Trump do this, though? Because the, the GOP is kind of in a corner because all their talking points were kind of snatched from them by Kamala Harris. And... One of their gripes, one of their talking points is this is not a democratic process. Kamala Harris wasn't properly primaried in. Uh, her supporters, democratic supporters, didn't necessarily vote for her. Um, the process was not um, trusted. How could he switch it up and still have that talking point? Is right. that talking point so dead that they're willing to do it? Mm. Yeah, I mean, I agree with that talking point. I think that's I don't true. Think. I agree with you. This is last week's discussion. You, you yeah. are correct um, ethically and morally, but I want the Dems to play a little dirty, and they're playing a little dirty. Yeah, I'm not going to rehash that. I'm saying I, I think yeah. that's a valid point, and I b believe it. But, right, if they're going to say at the last second, well, we're going to switch him out, I guess the argument would be that no one's voted for J.D. Vance either, so who gives a shit? Right, but like that's, you voted for that's Trump. part of process. You didn't vote, you didn't, oh, yeah. you didn't vote for Vance, so I see what you, you mean. could just swap him out because he's you actually never gotten the vote. VPs. Right. Yeah. You just you try to hang them in their place of work. <laughs> um. They're for murdering. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> in the oldest way possible. Um, yeah, I mean, I hope they don't swap him out because he's really funny and he makes me happy. So for my benefit... I hope they keep him on the ticket because he's just giving us nuggets. Like, what's this obsession about, like, families? We need to, okay. We, we're burying the lead. The elephant in the room is one of us is soaring with a full family, just free <laughs> as a bird. And the other one's shackled by the clock. You just look at the clock and you're like, well, I have nothing oh. to do. You might as well just like throw me in a cage with the interns. J.D. Vance also has thoughts on this. Yeah, he's a big family guy. <laughs> right. Loves the family. I mean... I, this must yeah. come from a place of like white replacement theory. Yeah. It has to. But his, he's got a kid named Vivek. Yeah, well, he betrayed the white family. <laughs> right. I mean, shout out to does, Vivek. Does, right? he, does he actually have a kid named Vivek? Yes. That's so fucking tight. <laughs> yeah. I mean, on paper, I kind of like this guy. But everything out of his mouth is like, oh, I <laughs> fucking hate it. <laughs> well, but this is in part the insidiousness of this 2025 idea. Yeah. Like, this schmuck is going <laughs> to institute... Like white Christian fascism upon the country? That'll never happen. You're like, oh god damn it, he did it. <laughs> this guy, the guy with the guy with the Mao t shirt who's 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 screwing the love seat. <laughs> I mean so he claims I have a theory. Well he claims that uh people with without family without children are not as equipped to make the right voting judgments or pay the right kind of taxes. Like their voice in America is marginalized because they don't understand the pressures of being a parent and raising a family and having that that vision, that ethical vision that I have been. Um, but I have a theory. One, no kids, ethical. One kid, kind of cool, but kind of sus. Two kids, extremely ethical. Anything more than two, you are debaucherous and live in Satan's lair. 
If you have more than two kids, man, you are doing some fucked up shit to our planet. You you see yourself as like, kind of like a spreading your seed across this land. I saw a documentary about this on Netflix. One of those Thor type dudes. Like having more than two kids is a tell. And I see you, JD Vance. Have you seen this? Viral. I don't, know, I, I don't know if it was on TikTok. I, I saw it on on Twitter. Or, you know, but it's this guy, and he's got he lives on a farm somewhere. Six kids. I don't know if he was an influencer. Oh, of course. I, I don't. People I, we I don't hate know for his, no reason. Yeah. Right. Yes. One of those gents. I, I don't know where he came from originally, but he's like, isn't it everybody's dream to live on a homestead with six kids and your wife and milk cows and make your own cheese? I'm like. Well, I think the history of humanity says that it's not. Right. Like, there's People nothing wrong with stuff. being a farmer, but we have millennia and millennia and millennia of history that shows that farming is not the end pursuit of, of mankind. It's tough, right? Because it's kind of the beginning of civilization, but it doesn't end up being the beginning towards the middle towards the end or where we are right and i agree wouldn't like, you like is... to domesticate wheat <laughs> i mean this is the gentrification discussion like people just like to move around and do new things lebron james isn't betraying cleveland he just wants to live on a beach but that example you're talking about on the internet was interesting because internet sleuths immediately found out that she was an ex ballerina ballerinist and she had a career, and he somehow snatched her from that against her will, assumingly. And then she also had to hide the fact that she wanted an epidural during one of the procedures during the birth of her child and called him sexist and maybe, like, overbearing on her life. I don't know where all this stuff is coming from. You have to ask her, and I don't even believe anybody if you put a mic in front of them. This is all nothing stuff, right? Oh, I, I don't even know this whole backstory. The, the, the tea that you're spilling. I love Twitter. But, yeah, I, I think this, this family, however fraudulent they are, just this, this concept of agrarian society being more virtuous. I don't have a problem with people who decide that that's for them. But... Humanity is all about cities. But shh. It's about like culture. As, it's, as it's, someone, there's, nothing, there's nothing wrong with saying, my vision is milking cows. Cool. You want to live like a surf. You're saying the quiet part a little too loud, man. Because me and you love looking up Caitlin Clark stats, looking up Jason Tatum fraudulent accumulation numbers. That's like a good life for me personally. I don't want to work on a farm, but I do want to eat those vegetables and eat that bread. I don't want to fight for our country, but I do like the idea of safety. Like, for our troops, for the farmers, I just want to be in front of my computer, preferably over the sink, eating all the good things with my freedom intact. Okay, I'm going to go to the farmer's market, get these delicious stone fruit, Eat them over some sort of basin while you live in a feudal society that you've set up somewhere, I don't know, out of eyeshot. And uh, you can raise your kids over there and do whatever you want to do with those goats. Deal. <laughs> Are you JD Vancing uh, an entire way of life? <laughs> Bro. Um, but, I, but you know what I mean? It's just like I want people to feel this, something I don't feel, which is like, farming is more ethical and it is and it's american and it's the way civilization was made but like i'm just a bastard reading reaping the rewards of all everyone's hard work on basketball reference eating a damn croissant just speed reading through novel after novel <laughs> i mean we don't want to talk about basketball yet but is the eye test less masculine than stats Ooh, that's a good one. Mm. We'll get to that because, later. Yeah. Because, yeah, 
<laughs> we uh, we fictionalize a lot, right? Culture, Michael Jordan, yeah, can, originalism. Yeah, can, can, no, no, this is a great idea. Can we reposition stats as like <laughs> the nonfiction? Yes, the real man's take is that he uh, that his value of a replacement player is uh, through the roof this year, and you're over there talking about his will to win like a girl. <laughs> You're talking about America and representing our country as the reigning champion. I'm talking about the irrelevance of a volume shooter. I'm talking about usage rate. <laughs> We're talking 100 possessions. You over there with your whimsical 36 minutes. What is that? What does that even mean? What Speaking of fiction, whimsy and fiction, did you watch the opening ceremonies? Was there pomp? Perhaps? There was a lot of pomp, bro. There was there was some scandal. There was some okay. I have to be honest. I love opening ceremonies and closing ceremonies. Of I love the Olympics. Period. I find them to be kind of emotional and incredible to see like the world come together and kind of like wear with their flags and play sport. I fucking love this shit. I'm also washed, so forgive me. I'm not really into the pomp. I'm more of a circumstance guy. You're more manly than I am, but we know this. I mean... I have cats. To me, it it feels as if they're making stuff up during these opening ceremonies. These national anthems. What is this, music? (laughs) I did not expect you to say national anthem. I'm sorry, that was very good. (laughs) You got me. (laughs) The fuck is this song? (laughs) This this, this invented country with an invented song that goes along with it? What, do you have a language that you invented? (laughs) Or you came up with a a tongue? (laughs) I was like, I expected you to, like, talk about, like, crimes of humanity and fictionalized borders, but you're talking about jams. (laughs) Gay like ass it. mother tongue that you're singing in. Ah, <laughs> oh, that's my favorite part. When you hear all these, ah, oh, it's beautiful, man. Come on, it is a. What are we doing on Earth if this does not move you? You like you like the costumes? Of course I do. I love it all, man. I know you said that facetiously, but I love the costumes. I think Team USA look great. I love this country. I think, uh, yo, if you were gonna tell the story of like what we wear. It's got to be Ralph Lauren, right? Like, or Tommy Hilfiger, or like, who else you got? Calvin Klein. Like, this is just America. Like, we're not wearing things that aren't a suit jacket and washed out jeans. I like that the uniforms, or the the outfits that the U.S. team was wearing during the opening ceremony, they felt very Americana, as you said. They were wearing blue jeans blazers, striped shirts. Like the vibes were immaculately, I don't know, 2003 Jay-Z's playing. <laughs> the DJ. Oh my god. <laughs> is, Dude, is Clue. You're breaking my heart. <laughs> it's DJ Clue. It, it, Cluminati is there. We're Pictures. at Avenue. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um I mean, isn't this what the Olympics is for? Like, it can't be, it can't be not like us. They can't be like Crip walking up on that stage yet. Give it 20 more years. Um, But it has to kind of reside where people of 50, 60, 70 years old can identify, right? Yeah, I did think that the the, uh, Ralph Lauren outfits were a little strange. No, oh, how so? I mean, you're the fashion oh, only guy. because. Tell me, tell me. I, I don't know. I just mean, they were. They, I don't know. You saw the ones that, I don't know, that Telfar did for Liberia. Oh, but those—that's a different those, game. You know, like different you, game. Different you're game. making a splash More, there, right? I right. Like different, different game. Yeah. They look. They look great. I only mean that the U.S. ones were just like, hey, you know, like. Welcome to Bungalow 8. But are we not a nation? It's the 4040 Club. Right. I mean, what's up with spread collars, first of all? I hate spread collars. And like, I know, I know we're the collar people. Mm. Find another slant. But, like, I hate a spread collar. It has to be, like, kind of a right angle to me. I don't like those 
obtuse angles. Hmm. Do you like a Mao collar by any chance? A Mandarin green, collar, as they're also start called. Green with red. I mean, no, not necessarily, but I may have. I may be mistaken. Can you describe them? The Mandarin collars are. I would say they're thinner. Very circular. There's not really the uh, no, lapel no, no. that comes down. I can't down. do the circular ones. No, no, no. No, thank you. I got tricked into buying one of those in 2001. My fashion designer friend was just like, everyone's going to be wearing these. It's cool. I'm like, I want to fit in. I'll take it. Woo! Never wore <laughs> You just rolling through Chinatown in your Mandarin collar. And it was like plaid. And, you know, it was right next to Telfar hmm. stuff. And, like, yo, yeah. it was the era where we're... we're yeah, I was 23 years old, not a worry in the world, thinking my Mandarin collars would pop off. Did you ever go to 4040 Club? Once, but in a haze. I had end beer, and I ended up there once. So I think I was chasing Chris Webber with our friend Josh Wilder, maybe. <laughs> uh, no joke. Someone told me or us that Webber, and this was before I had a smartphone. So it was like flip phone era. It's like, yo, Weber's at the 4040 Club, and me and Lawman were like, let's go. <laughs> I don't know. That's all. Why, why? Did I miss out on, a, on an era? No, I, I, I went there a couple times, not, not a lot either. Yeah. I went there for like a Snoop Dogg event. <laughs> what is this, I don't remember him being there. What is this, the opening ceremony of the Olympics? No, he was making some sort of energy alcohol drink. And we kept <laughs> calling it Snoop Doggy Drizzle, but that wasn't actually what it was named. Like, yeah, it's the Doggy Drizzle event. Are you going to go? I And uh, that's all I really remember about it, was that we were drinking this, this really foul-tasting Snoop Doggy Drizzle beverage. <laughs> you, know what I, you know what I hate seeing backstage is Dr. I mean, <laughs> Diet Mountain Drizzle. <laughs> Blimping me out. Oh, I have a, a little aside here, Andrew. I really felt... I had an incredible moment a few days ago. One of the strangest moments I've had in a long time. Really felt as if I was sort of controlling the universe at, at one mm-hmm. with the, the cosmos. Mm-hmm. Can, I, can I tell this tale? Oh my God, I'm dying. Yeah, do it. So I was, I was eating a tortilla chip in my kitchen. <laughs> I love it already. <laughs> you had me, <laughs> a tortilla chip. <laughs> and I took three crunches. <laughs> you know... First was the crunch into the chip. The second, the subsequent two were chews. You know, like crunch, crunch, crunch. And with each crunch, I heard from outside a dog bark. Mm. <laughs> exactly synchronized with each crunch. Mm. And after the third crunch and the third bark that happened exact, exactly the same time, I paused. I was like, that's weird. <laughs> it's mm. a dog barking every time I crunch this chip. And I paused and there was silence. And then I bit again, and it was another dog bark exactly oh, at the no. same time. This is incredible. So and it's, I, I kind of, I kind of freaked out. I was like, "I'm controlling the universe. My crunches are timing with this dog outside. Like either the dog is barking in my head, or I am manipulating my environment." And then the dog just kind of started barking, and I realized that I was not, in fact, controlling the barking dog with this tortilla chip. Did you look to your left and see if Keanu Reeves was wearing like a, a kind of full skirt outfit next, with sunglasses next to you? He or was. maybe Lawrence Fishburne in the room doing Kung Fu? I feel like I was Neo. Like I was the one. It's sort of like, I love this story and thank you for sharing. It's sort of like on social media when you see people like catch a glass like with their back hand and they do the Spider-Man web thing to see if they actually have superpowers. Did you immediately walk to the sink and see if you could eat this chip over the sink? I was just sort of ag- agog, Andrew. <laughs> Someone's been reading novels. <laughs> Busted. I kind of staggered backwards. <laughs> that is pretty yeah. incredible. I mean, I don't want to I don't want to diminish this story because that would destroy my brain for like a few years. Oh, there was a one time I was eating a chip and it was synchronized to two dogs barking randomly. I mean, it was a total of four chews. 
and four dog barks exactly on beat with a pause in between, I gotta say. And I'm not talking about a dog's pause. Is there a Fibonacci sequence theory with beat matching? Well, like, is a dog barking and a mouth chewing some sort of some sort of golden ratio in nature where it's like that cadence occurs more than any other cadence? Like, boom. boom there must boom. be. Right. <laughs> it has to be. I mean, you might be chewing too fast, elephant? though. You, you got to slow down. I mean, like, I, I, you, you're a 20 year veteran. You're you LeBron tempo. James in your sixth Olympics. You got to chew some slow. I'll give you shit. the tempo. I'll give you the tempo. Okay. A crunch, crunch, crunch. Oh, that, that's very. Good. I don't think that was a hasty, a hasty crunching. It wasn't crunch, 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 crunch. <laughs> wow, you're the, you're the slow mo of tortilla chips. Anyway, I just thought you should ass. know that well, I've mean, been doing some really crazy shit over here. That do you have any other examples where you saw the Matrix? Like in the famously in the movie, it's deja vu, right? Like so, fuck that. Deja vu is off the table because that's just a made up thing in a not masculine story. But do you have any other examples where you're just like, I fucking knew it? Hmm. I'm sure because I'm you know because I had this tortilla chip experience, my powers have been revealed at other points. <laughs> uh I don't know. Have you have you have you glimpsed the other side, Andrew? I think about this in my studio a lot as I'm doing my other job, which isn't making perfect pods. And when mm-hmm. I paint abstract paintings, I have a, this idea that if I don't have a plan going into it, and I just do whatever the painting tells me to do, I'm going to end up with kind of the same painting every time. So that's kind of what I try to do in my studio. I'm just like. Am I Neo or am I Sam Jackson or am I one of those dudes with white dreads? This is what I want to find out with this artistic pursuit. That makes sense to me. Or am I one of those like robotic octopi? I don't know. Mm, I think you're the a white dread with a mandarin collar. <laughs> if we do 500 more perfect pods, are we going to talk about eating over the sink again one more time? Well, maybe we've discussed this before. The idea that all birds eventually become vultures. Oh yeah, this is my favorite shit. That they're the they're at the end. Vultures are at the end of their evolutionary journey. So if there's a million more pods, by the end it's just us saying "eat over the sink" over and over for two hours. Yes, that would be the vulture uh, theory. Like the hyper optimized version of our pod is just eat over the sink in repetition with a dog barking outside. I don't know. It could be ethical basketball, ethical basketball, ethical basketball, or it could be rats, 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 rats. I, I don't know, but those are all wonderful outcomes. Yeah, I, I, I eagerly await the evolution. <laughs> we'll find out in a month or two. <laughs> <laughs> we'll find out next week. I'm cooking yeah. soups. Uh, 2025 season. We'll find out. <laughs> Um, so I know there was some discussion of an issue that's really close to your heart mm. this week. Um, Kamala Harris released a statement condemning flag burning. And I know you're someone who loves burning a flag. Mm. That's kind of... Since I've met you, you've always engulfed flags in flames whenever the given the opportunity. Yeah, <laughs> I do. Any flag I see, I kind of like to burn it. Um, what's what's the deal with people still getting upset about flag burning? Why 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 would anybody care about that? I got into this stuff when I did a reimagined flag for the New York Times style uh, opinion section uh, during COVID, and it opened a window into MAGA social media that I was halfway not expecting, where they found me, and they were like, "You're not a real American. How could you desecrate our?" symbols like this and I did not respond but I kind of like commiserated with their point of view symbols mean a lot right like if you walked up to me and spiked a ripe peach and spit on a Jeremy Lin jersey you'd hurt my feelings I 
get why symbols matter. So I don't want to be flippant and be like, the flag is a fictional thing. Uh, the Last Supper is a fictional story. How dare you desecrate it by um, envisioning it different than I did. On one hand, I'm interested in people who do that. On another hand, I understand people who are upset by it. So I think what Kamala Harris is doing is trying to get votes because she knows that this matters. But I find myself, when I think about it, understanding people who are like, please don't burn that LeBron jersey. <laughs> I, I mean, to me, it's that she said, you know, she criticized that and saw John Kirby, your guy, came out and said, you know, that's just unacceptable. What? Flag burning is unacceptable. I think it's I'm not, unacceptable. <laughs> right. it's, but I mean, it's, yeah. it's, it's literally acceptable. <laughs> Nonviolent protest is acceptable. It's... It's an object. It's a symbol of the country. And I, I, right. I mean, people do it because it makes other people upset. It's a, it's a trolling mechanism. Yeah. It's, it's solely symbology. And if no one cared, then people wouldn't do it. There was an old, like, Abby Hoffman era thing. Like, if someone's burning a flag, that's the op. <laughs> like, that's someone who's infiltrated your organization. It's <laughs> like... Uh, most people aren't really invested in burning a flag. It's kind of like, yeah, that that person is police. I like that theory because most normal people don't rush to burn Stefan Marbury jerseys, you know, or Trey Young jerseys. But, uh, yeah, I mean, is is the sanctity of objects kind of restricted to symbols like like I could burn something blue and orange but as soon as it has a Knicks jersey on it, it it's different <laughs> right, I mean right. a Knicks logo right? totally totally yeah and I think there's also a element of this that's coupled with this American hyper freak out over property damage <laughs> these things all kind of go that's together right. that's right I think it's like they did what to a Sitco? Yeah. They broke a window at a, at a, at a gas station? Yeah. Oh, lock them up. <laughs> Put like, them away. And it bears mentioning that like people who are very upset by this are, I think, also a bit performative because there's Blue yeah. Lives Matter flags. There's Trump photoshopped over a flag. I, I, I have a father-in-law who served in the military, who every time I visit him makes me fold a flag with him. And he's like, <laughs> it's kind of crazy, right? Like, he's like, don't let it touch the ground and do it crisp. Do it like you mean it. But he's like, chill about it. He was like, isn't this weird? Like, look at this city slicker. Like, look, I'm making you uncomfortable over here, you know? He likes guns and all that. Do some origami. Yeah, pretty much, right? It's like, when does this become a beautiful crane? He was like, not on my watch. <laughs> <laughs> when does this become a Chinese finger trap? It's like mm, off my property. So I pull the tail on the flag and the head yeah. goes up. <laughs> I mean, it's cool. I like people who think this shit is valuable, but I reside in the community that doesn't think that way, you know? Uh, now I can't stop this idea of him handing you the flag as you, and you solemnly turn it into a flying dragon. I mean, do you want me to make this into a scorpion or not? <laughs> um, but, like, yeah, it makes me think of, like, the prisoner of war flag. That thing is, like, one of the coolest images of a flag, that black and white one with the silhouette <laughs> of the soldier. But there are no prisoners of war. But you kind of see that flag below the American flag a lot. And a lot oh, of people all the time. Like, all the time. All the time, right? And people are like, there is not really a prisoner of war issue in America. Like, they're kind of all accounted for. There's maybe one or two, but it's like it's not an issue. But that flag kind of goes with the American flag. Oh, I, I mean, I know that flag well. Yeah. And um, I don't know. It, yo, flags are meant to be changed, right? Like, didn't they change all the state flags recently, or the city flags? The, there was there was talk, and certain places have changed, but a lot of them looked very Reddit. That's right. Yeah, yeah. They were they were super generic. I don't know if it was 
a few places did contests and said, hey, redesign the flight. Honestly, most of them were, were cheeks. i got to be honest. <laughs> Mo cheeks? Um, yeah, it could looked you like... Tur- could you turn the POW MIA flag yeah. into maybe some kind of lotus flower? I was like, what are you... Be careful with your words, man, because... <laughs> You're going to get people upset out here. But um, every time there's a logo change, like this is the new IBM logo. Everyone's like, this is blasphemy. I'm like, what the fuck? It's just a logo. But we, this matters to many people, myself included. You know, like I do like certain Knicks logos and not others. If they redesigned the Knicks logo to look like uh, Leprechaun in blue and orange, I'd be like, I'm done. I'm out. I'm, I'm going to live my life. I'm going to go touch grass. As we subtly pivot towards discussing basketball, what do you think of the merch that's gone along with the Olympics, like the USA basketball stuff? Any, any thoughts? Man, I under, we've discussed like the Utah Jazz logo, the, the Fashion House logos, right? Like all these uh, serif to ornamental logos kind of turning into these sans serif equally spaced things. And, um, and I think it's more functional sort of like modern buildings made out of concrete as opposed to spires and columns. It's functional and it is readable and usable as opposed to flowery. Maybe it's more masculine and it, maybe it tells fewer stories, right? So the USA design for this Olympics is disappointing to me for sure, but we're like 30 years from the reign of like Shermayev and Geismar and they kind of ushered in the simplicity of stuff. Like they redesigned the UPS logo. Instead of a box with a bow, they simplified it into a shield. And like, you know, is the FedEx logo with that arrow that cool? Maybe the most famous logo, you know? And you add 40 years to it, and we're at a point where it's just been reduced to sans serif typography that is instantly recognizable and instantly rememberable but not unique that might be the vulture of visual <laughs> communication it's like wherever Balenci ed- ended up <laughs> yeah I mean it's useful especially as, as we're looking at things on high resolution screens pixelized right um, I don't know if a mountainscape that says jazz on it with a gradient is easier to read than a yellow and black type. As, as we're discussing this, I'm, I'm looking at the Kith website with the USA Basketball collection on it. Most of them sold out, so I guess they did well. I feel a little weird about the ones that say USA Basketball and huge lettering across the front and then have the Kith logo. I saw I that. Get, yeah. I get it on the tag. I get it maybe on the sleeve. USA Basketball with Kith written beneath it. It's a little weird. Do you remember when the logos on organized sports jerseys was controversial? It's like, well, I don't want Mr. Beast next to, like, the Houston <laughs> Rockets logo or wherever. You know, it's like that. The Houston Rockets logo is sacred to me, even though it changes every year. And uh, I don't want... Uh, a local car dealership sullying that. And then that happened and we forgot about it. Um, Staples like, Center. Ex- is- I'm sorry, Bumble. Yeah. Are you deflowering <laughs> the LA Clippers sacred logo? Yeah. Popularized Shopify. by Blake Griffin? Yeah. And, and like, however much I love the pomp of the Olympics, like, on one hand, I'm like, go ahead and desecrate it. On another hand, I'm like, well, now we can judge like who is desecrating it and if we like it and like what kind of story you're throwing clay onto more clay with. And like, I don't know, like, you know, Kith is, Kith's motives are different than Nike's motives and Supreme's motives and Bumble's motives, right? I think they're just looking for volume. They are volume shooters. They're Jason Tatum. They're like, you may not like this, but we're so ubiquitous and everywhere that we're just going to become an heir. You know where Jason Tatum is not ubiquitous? On the floor. 
for Team USA in yesterday's victory over Serbia and reigning MVP, Nikola Jokic, Jason Tatum, who member of the Boston Celtics, who have still yet to win a title because no championship was awarded last season, did not get any minutes. Now, there were jokes about it. Lots of jokes. Lots of, lots of funny, funny jokes. Not funny jokes. This is serious. This is about the flag, Ben. We're talking about desecration. That's right. In some ways, the coach of the team, Steve Kerr, stomped on Lucky the Leprechaun yesterday. <laughs> he saged Boston Garden figuratively by keeping Tatum, Jason Tatum, on the bench. What's going on here, Andrew? Was, was this a, a disgrace? Was this an insult? What, what happened? This is not Halliburton Erasure either, who also didn't play any minutes. And it also fueled the Jason Tatum jokes because Halliburton is like the, the target of the ire of everyone who thinks these new kids are whack because he's got crazy style. He talks funny. He's kind of a wet noodle. But Kerr is absolutely gaslighting because Tatum's going to play a ton of minutes. Moving like These starting lineups don't matter. The rotation doesn't matter. They're going to win. All these players are good enough where the sum of their parts are going to destroy the reigning MVP handily. Uh, so Tatum will play, but the opening game is the one I think people pay the most attention to just because we don't have fatigue yet. And I don't know. It's There's no necessity to give a player who's kind of a ball stopper an effective ball stopper controls the tempo of the game in his own way who whose value is derived from volume and possession like there's too many good players on the team also Kerr's fucking with everyone he maybe that could be true I also look at it as Tatum's a forward this is a team that is ultimately about three guys. It's about LeBron. It's about KD. It's about Steph. They're going to get starting slots. They're going to get a lot of minutes. This is the final Olympics, almost definitely, for three of the greatest players of all time. And probably the three most famous basketball players on the planet. They are our ambassadors of the sport and have been. And this is their last opportunity. It's their team. Two of those guys are forwards. Like I know, <clears throat> I know. Role wise, LeBron, you know, led the team in assists, and he is a, a different kind of player than, say, Jason Tatum. But you just kind of don't need him, and that's right. not to say he won't get on the court at he will later moments. Play. Yeah, yeah. No, they're not going to. Also, they're not going to humiliate a really well regarded player who's coming off of a title because they don't want him alienated. They kind He's of already be a did. Part of the team. <laughs> That's it. Oh, it, it ha- <laughs> yeah. I'm saying it happened, but mm-hmm. if you just don't play him, then he's not going to come out and be in the next Olympics, the one after that, because he has one going forward. He he has got op- he's got ample opportunities to be on Olympic teams, and you also might discourage players. I'm not going to go out there and sit, I'm be humiliated, and jokes are made about me. Fuck that. Yeah. So I think he will obviously get minutes. But realistically, looking at this team, they just don't have like a real need for his skill set. They need Derek White. They need Drew Holiday. You know, point of attack defenders, guys who pass, guys who knock down open shots. They need more guys who are like the players who helped carry the Celtics to a title than another scorer. Because you already have KD, you have Anthony Edwards, you have LeBron, you have guys, you have Booker players who are just as good in that role and might fit better around KD and LeBron. Yeah, man, you're ready to go out with your homies, you get the crew together. It's like, all right, you know, we got to get into the club. We got to get the table. We got to get the bottles. And everyone's good. At, it's like, oh, I know someone at the door. Or, you know, I got some money. I'll get the bottles. <laughs> and someone else is like, I'm already here. I can secure the table. And then the one guy's like, I'm really good at drinking. It's like, yeah, yeah, you're fun. We love you. 
it's like, what can you do? It's like, I'm really good at drinking. It's like, oh, we, we're all really good at drinking. <laughs> But what else can you do to help the situation? It's like, I can come along. It's like, okay, you can definitely come with us, but like, we don't need you right now. At the end of the night, when this is all secured and we're having a good time watching <laughs> Travis Scott for the fifteenth time, you can, you can be the one. You know, you can have your your turn in the spotlight. But like, we don't need you to do anything. And like, Tatum's in that kind of situation where it's like guys i can knock down a shot it's like yeah yeah all these guys can can you play defense can you facilitate the offense like maybe but i'm not really known for that what i'm known for is knocking down those shots at a league average rate it's like we're gonna give those shots to lebron can you do anything else it's like well i can wait for my shot it's like all right (laughs) we'll have you play against another opponent but the first game like we want to make this the lebron kd steph moment it's like okay we've got our boy band (laughs) <laughs> got our we got our lover boy over here Tony Fatone what's his name Tony Fatone <laughs> we, we got the we got the sensitive guy uh, we got the we got the preppy guy we got the weirdo and we and we got the bad boy <laughs> yeah. like, alright cool can I join I'm a bad boy <laughs> <laughs> we got oh, a yeah, bad we boy have, we got a bad boy okay 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 <laughs> what if I'm the sensitive guy mm, I think we're pretty much covered in the sensitive guy <laughs> right. area Huh. All right. Well, uh, I don't know. Um, what about a what about a preppy guy? <laughs> no, no, we're we're good. We're good on that. <laughs> I mean, watching Jalen Brown's frustration on social media is like kind of sad for me because I feel for him. You know, the Celtics media don't ask him the hard hitting questions, things that he actually is thinking about, and like even Grant Hill kind of has to mention that, and. Um, he is not necessarily he's like the seventh guy of the boy band being like well you have two sensitive guys can i be the third sensitive guy it's like god damn you need a ho you need a hotep yeah it's like do you know how to work nunchucks because we need a nunchuck guy it's like no but i'm sensitive it's like we got two of them already um it is all right who's the guy who you know reads behold the pale horse yeah you need one of those guys in the band um, and uh, the pale horse in the opening ceremony, people got mad. But uh, it it it's like it's humiliating because he is the reigning fictional novella champ of the NBA and MVP, and his teammate Derek White, who we all know is the better player. KP, Drew Holiday, Derek White are the ones who pushed. These volume scores, Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum over the top. Jason Tatum, Jalen Brown, beatable. We know this. With those three guys, ooh, given their path, hard to beat, right? They just won a ton of games. So that's why Drew Holiday and Derek White were on this team because it's like, you can do the nunchucks. You're on this team. Oh, you're good with swords? You're on this team. We need a sword and nunchuck guy. It's like, and we're sensitive. It's like, perfect. You guys are on the team. It's like, but I'm only sensitive. It's like, Drew has you covered. Yeah, I mean, that's the funny part about them adding Derek White is that Jalen Brown's sitting there saying, well, I'm the MVP of the finals, and they added three of my teammates. Who's next? Al Horford? Like they're just putting everybody on the team except for me? It's like, Horford would be more well, helpful. Well, they're putting the guys who made your team good on a team with players right. who are better than you. Right, right. You follow? Like, well, yeah. You're not being neglected. There are better players who do what you do already. And they're the same players who made the Celtics a no- nominal champion. <laughs> right, right. And I feel for Jalen Brown because he's supposed to think he's the best. This confidence is like what fuels all these players. And he's watching three of his teammates on that yacht cruising up like it's fun you want to be there representing it's an easy win you just have to dunk a couple times sadly that's all he wants to do it's like why can't i dunk a few times like i got hops it's like we have many (laughs) guys with hops who like we have to give it to lebron james needs to take every dunk how much usa basketball are you planning on watching i i tuned in for some of the exhibition games but not usually in their entirety the problem is that 
for some reason, it's hard to find good box scores. It's hard to find updated What's up with stats. Like, it's bizarre. It's like, oh, you just don't have box score technology over there? Like, oh, I don't know. This is happening in France. How, I don't know how we get it stateside. And like, How is this still a problem? We had this issue with the World Cup of basketball, right? Where we were looking for stats, and it's like, you can find them. They're there, but they're not just like in your face, like NBA.com or ESPN.com, wherever you get your normal regular season stats. They're just not there. I, I even have trouble finding WNBA stats sometimes. I go to their own app. That app is terrible and crashes all awful, the time. It's, awful, awful, awful. It's buggy as hell. Like, it is not good. It doesn't make the experience of, like, sifting through numbers enjoyable but the WNBA app stinks. It I, stinks I bought it you know paid for the whole season it automatically logged me out for no reason right and then it won't let me reset my password and won't send me an email or anything it just it's just useless oh my God, I, I can't get back into it I don't even know who to call it's just it's just bricked yeah, it's hard scrolling scores from day to day, left to right. The the buttons are gummy. You click on a game and it gives you the previous game. It just like sends you on a choose your own adventure app. Oh yeah, that's one of the most wild parts of it. Might be even common to the site too. You'll go on there looking for today's game and it'll give you like the start of the week and you yeah. scroll up until today. Yeah. Fucking bizarre. And uh, yo, I think talented designers. It's how, the, it's how the mind of a woman works. Apparently. Oh Jesus Christ! Everyone's reading novels now, <laughs> cat. Um, but there's only a few talented designers in the world. And when I mean a few, I'm like a few thousand probably who are good at this. And like they're all locked up by the big companies like Microsoft, Apple, Google, maybe Amazon. The ones with money. This happens in the art world. There's like four like major galleries gobbling up all like the, the market talent. And that's how I feel about design. It's just like, why can't the WNBA do this? I'm like, because everybody who would do this is making more money at Microsoft. And it's may, that may sound weird, but like it's a finite talent. And you, you see it when the Olympics happen. I'm like, why is this a mess? It's because there's no job security in something that happens one out of every four years, and people just look elsewhere. That's why we get J.D. Vance as our VP. I was looking at the box score for yesterday's game. Like, oh, you don't have on-off numbers on this, huh? Hmm. Just couldn't, yeah. couldn't, couldn't get that together. Couldn't, couldn't muster up people's plus-minus. Great work. Quick, uh, quick question. Yeah, no, plus-minus oh, an yes. advanced stat? No. No, right? God damn it. I, this is one of my pet peeves, Ben. When people are like, oh, his plus minus was so and so. It's like, oh, you were in your nerdy advanced stats. I'm like, that is not an advanced stat. That is just like a quick reading of statistics in minutes. Yeah, it's literally what was the score while you were on the court. Yeah, I know. Anyway. Like, that's not advanced at all. It's like, oh, how did your team do when you were on the floor? Not. Not really good. that advanced. Um, but yeah, are you going to watch a lot of the USA basketball games here? I'm going to try. My days are pretty packed, but I'm going to try. I want like the the alerts on my phone being like, US is going to, the US is down against South Sudan with two minutes ago. I'm like, oh, scrambling to find a, maybe rush if, if I went to Russian feeds, streaming sites, if I partook in that avenue of media consumption, I might log on very quickly. Um, I, I'm going to watch some of it. I, I, I would have liked to watch uh, the game between uh, Puerto Rico and South Sudan. That was a nice win for South Sudan, and it's worth shouting out our guy, Royale Ivy, who was on the winning team, the last lap squad, in the very first Cookies Hoops Classic. Seemed like a very chill dude. I spoke with him briefly. An aptly uh, named man. Yeah, he he's seemed awesome. He's, he's cool. Always been supportive. And uh, he at that point, he was coaching the Knicks. Then he uh, was an assistant coach in the Nets. I'm not sure exactly where his day job is. He might still be with the Nets. It could be, so, I forget exactly where. But he is the coach of the South Sudan team. And 
they got a chance to shock the world on Wednesday. Yeah. They're playing the U.S. And they already played them tough. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, a lot of, as read in the, the perfect book about basketball, the joy of basketball, South Sudan is like a, a, a well of talent for the NBA, and a lot of NBA quality players have come from that area in Africa, and I, it just sucks that the, the USA team is so dominant. Like, you know how they were talking about Caitlin Clark being like, well, she doesn't really, rookies don't really qualify for this honor. I'm like, but college players used to play, and that was fun. And, like, my, I guess my question to you is, like, is sportsmanship important in a simulation like the Olympics? Is it important for countries to be ethical? But where is ethical when the goal is maybe just to win? I, I thought the the ban on professional athletes didn't make a lot of sense. Still true in boxing, right? If I'm not mistaken, only amateurs can box. I think I think you're right. I, but it yeah. just seems kind of beside the point. It's like, well, if we're going to get the best yeah. of the best, then it's you should have whoever you want on your team. And yeah. if the U.S. wanted to say, hey, we're just going to send amateurs, that's how it is. That would have been cool too. But it is it is showbiz, right? And we're seeing with Caitlin Clark, allegedly, there's not a lot of buzz around the women's national team. And people were like, well, it's because you left off the one player we're interested in. Sadly, to admit, you know, we don't want it to be this way because there's some legends and goats on the women's team, Dinah Tarazi. But, like, everyone is interested in Caitlin Clark. And... It is showbiz, and you know the women's team was like, you have to earn your way onto this, and there's no quick path, even though she's popular. And I'm kind of with the Caitlin Clark, LeBron James camp, being like, LeBron James was the flag bearer, and you know, he, however much I don't want to smoke a blunt with him, I find him to be like one of the great ambassadors for our country, and that was a really cool moment. And without him, you have a different narrative right and it was so cool watching him holding that flag should have been kd to be honest but like um i think the more celebrities the better for everybody the the people watching people writing people rooting casuals experts everything that's a a rule that you've always lived by you know i like famous celebs i like famous the better bring on the celebs says andrew quo do you want to pass the blunt to trying to think of someone without offending offending them um Jalen Brunson or LeBron James come on LeBron James get out of here Brunson's just a Timberland bring on wearing bring on the celebs yeah yeah um but I I think the point that you made about the women's team was that at the time when they made that decision it felt morally sound Nah. No, no. I, I mean, from them, like, no, no. They had It's about more the best support. players. Right. She's going to have her ch- opportunities, opportunities. She hasn't earned it. And now you look at it and you're like, well, you bungled this golden opportunity because you could have put Angel Reese and her on the team Amazing. and everyone would be watching every single game. And when it would have been like an absolute heater. Instead, no one's really tuning in to watch, admittedly, players who are better or deserve it, the Asia Wilsons and, and Brianna Stewart, but you didn't put the, the hit makers on the record. Mm-hmm. And as, you're, as I'm watching the opening ceremonies, obviously in the America contingent, I'm looking for LeBron James, uh, Kevin Durant. And then right after those two, I'm like, ooh, Caitlin Clark, I would have been looking for her. It's like, who's she standing with? Is she in the front with LeBron? Like, that's where she would be, right? If that happened over with Caitlin Clark on the women's team, she would be standing next to LeBron James. She's that big of a star. I just think they missed an opportunity to even push the women's game forward with their presence. And whether or not that would have been controversial or made people unhappy, that's stuff you live with. If you're a restaurant and you your sous chef comes up or your your dishwasher comes up with a hit dish that drives people to your restaurant you're like that's not how we do it here you're like all right you're the head chef now 
Like, this is the whole plot of the bear. You're so bear max. I I think about the bear quite a bit, and I have not watched. You even you even like it, and you're no. fully bear pilled. But I'm consumed by hatred. You don't understand, man. When I look in the mirror, I see the bear, a rat man. Um, I love thinking about the bear. It's true. I, I can't deny it. So, so one thing I've been thinking about while you've been thinking about the bear mm-hmm. are some of the rules that go along with shooting around when you're warming up for a game. And it was a post that I saw and I, I retweeted it. And I said that there is... Well, let me, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me backtrack a second here. So the conversation is about decorum while warming up for pickup ball or, or it wouldn't be a game because a game you might be in in like organized basketball in lines and you have drills this is really you're at a playground you're at a pickup run more casual so you're shooting around and in one camp you have people who say if you miss a shot like you know tough tough luck it, whoever gets the rebound now he hucks up a shot and he makes a couple and he gets it back until he misses now there's the other side of this which is basketball culture and it's that if you miss a shot, then the guy who gets the rebound, or woman, of course, passes the ball to the shooter who takes a layup. And then the ball, at that point, goes back to the rebounder and they repeat this process. I don't know if that's confusing or not, but where do you stand on this, Andrew? It's bullshit. The, the joy of basketball and the joy of sports is breaking down these codes and i get why that happens because the person who rebounds the ball their turn is to shoot and the time it takes for them to run out to a, the three-point line might as well just like do a layup drill right it, it it's like throwing the baseball around the diamond after a strikeout yes i, I agree i think it's cool obviously i like it but we shouldn't abide by it and it's cultural right i think it's some people were like do you do this on the on the social media post it's like you guys do this where you're from because maybe you don't i've gone 50 50 i've played with people who don't do that and do do that who the fuck cares but like you can't play a there has to be some sort of structure you can't play a game of horse and not abide by the rules so I don't know. The uh, YMCA culture, I think, is fascinating to me because the most interesting people, like in skateboarding, are the people who break the rules. So growing up in Rochester, New York, we did not do that. We just shot whoever got the rebound, put it up. And that has seemingly not changed because someone who, who commented beneath my tweet was like, what the hell is this? <laughs> so they were not familiar with it. I don't think they do in that New in New York City. Yeah, do they? In Jersey, everybody does it. Okay, everybody okay. does it here. It's like mandatory. Every playground, everywhere. As someone who has experienced both of these, I think that the the pass for the layup after a miss, vastly superior, if only because more people touch the ball. And it's there's more basketball stuff happening. It's like... You miss a shot, people fight for the rebound, the guy cut, the guy or woman cuts. You're always making a little fancy pass. You know, you're throwing a little behind the back, kind of no look. There's like a little a little swagger to it. Then when the cutter makes a layup, it might be like a little jelly reverse, it might be into a euro step. It's just a little horsing around. And then as you said, it's it's in the interim that another player then gets the rebound for that and kicks it out to the shooter. So it's like the shooter doesn't just have to kind of take the shot from wherever they get the rebound and they don't have to dribble out to that spot they go to their their place i think it's incredibly incredibly superior to get the rebound and chuck it up that feels like your chickens fighting over feed it's like randomized everyone's just kind of like scraping around and the other way everyone feels included there's more basketball stuff there's like a, a rebound there's two passes there's a layup I'm I'm all on on one side in this, Andrew. I gotta say, I get, the debate here isn't like what happens in the YMCA basketball court. It's good faith rituals versus bad faith rituals, right? And as as someone who's participated in 
baseball games and basketball yeah that it's it's lovely right like like you said everyone gets to touch the ball everyone gets to be in the moment and be present in a different way but i'm interested in bad faith stuff but only as a viewer right like back flips charging the mound uh disrespect on a basketball court lance stevenson shit like i love that stuff it's like that's not part of the code i'm like it is not, but it's interesting. And, you know, something like so, uh, thir- certain things like that are branded as rebellious, like skateboarding or rapping, like now you have codes and like you can't, that's not a real trick if you don't land it. And I'm like, well, this is interesting because like, are those good faith ideas or bad faith ideas? And I think they're mixed a lot. This basketball example is a good faith idea. I don't think anybody would be against it. Sort of like, a, a ball getting thrown or you know an outfielders playing catch before the in, an inning begins um but i don't want to get too comfy in that zone because it kind of ends up where skateboarding ends up in 2024 i don't want to make skateboarding twitter mad <laughs> they're so annoying and dangerous i mean uh, right and ethical I just feel like everyone's got to be on the same page. So if you're like, look, this is a, a, a playground where you should not expect the ball back, fine. And those could be the regional differences. Hey, this is, every court has different rules. And you could go to one place like, oh, we take the ball back to here. That's just how we play. We play with ones and twos on this court. We play with twos and threes. We play with all ones. And I think that's, in some ways, the way that basketball mirrors baseball a bit. Because the NBA, it's all rigid. Same rules, same dimensions. And then baseball, it's like, no, on this, you know, this field here, like the, there's a short porch there's in a left hill. field. Yeah. There's, there's, like, there's, okay, no, there's, there's water yeah. with kayaks over there. And yeah. All types of shit. Oh, the fence is really low. But when you're in, in playgrounds, like, oh, no, this is a really narrow court. So that's... There's no threes on the baseline. Like, okay, yeah. cool. I, and I, I, I think that's a fun part of it. I have a question for you. Like, if you're in Rochester, finish dining on your uh, chicken riggies and you're playing a little shoot around, um, and they're not doing this ritual, it's kind of how I feel about people, people's predilections on social media. There's some people that I really enjoy who just respond to news and other viral tweets and get their jokes off. And then there's another kind of tweeter who is just like, I'm going to give you a weird idea and see if it catches on. And I'm just going to give you three weird ideas every day and it may get two likes or 20,000 likes. But I don't want to respond to news or something else. I want to be the change that I want to see. So if you're playing, if you're shooting around in Rochester and no one's doing this, are you like, hey, let's give the guy a layup every time? Or do you just go with the flow? I feel like you can't really dictate the rules, but you could say cut. You could, and they probably would. Yeah, and you'd be like, you want, pass. yeah. But <laughs> what if the person taking the layup was like, my ball again dribbles out and starts shooting again? <laughs> exactly. Someone's getting punched, man. <laughs> that's where all jokes end. <laughs> like, that's a disrespect. Yeah, there are. <laughs> yeah. No, no, there are times when people don't do it, and there's, we have a mutual friend. I'm not going to say any names. <laughs> Does but, he have um, hot dog legs? No, no. no Jordan loves throwing the pass. Yeah, uh, he, yeah he's a... Sh- yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, one of our friends either forgets it or whatever, and you'll cut and just won't pass the ball. You're like... <laughs> ah, thanks, dude. Uh, like, <laughs> Come on. Yeah. And then... He'll miss, and you'll get the ball, and he won't cut. You're just holding it, waiting, waiting to throw up past him, and he just doesn't. He just wanders off somewhere. And sometimes when you're saying happens, they'll cut, and you, you throw the pass to him, he'll pick it up, and like shoot another jumper. Yeah. I mean, watching some pickup games is just watching like a love language of disrespect. You know, when people check <laughs> balls, or it's just like, I missed that shot and shoot around, but it bounced back to me, and I'm going to start again. I'm like, oh, yeah, the rebound came right to you but now someone's angrier than they were before. And some pickup games are just like this accumulation of this anger. 
I love accumulation of anger. You know who also accumulates a lot of anger? Russell Westbrook. Fueled by it. Or West Brick. No. <laughs> is he a help? Oh, he, hate, he hates that. Is he a useful player in 2024? I don't know. And we don't talk about the Nuggets too much. You know, they won a title two years ago. We know how great uh, Jokic is. We know they've lost some guys. Are they still a contender? I don't get irrationally mad at many players, but Michael Borer Jr. made me so mad this postseason. And he's got a lot going on. Yo, know, all of his brothers are like going to jail and stuff. It's it's really weird what's happening in that family. Obviously, he's mega pilled. I don't really care about that. I don't. I disagree with him there, but whatever. He's just a person. But he was so bad in the playoffs, and he eliminated basically his own team. And then we didn't get a good finals or conference finals. Like. Jokic would have just plowed through, I think, if Maga Porter Jr. just did his job and hit down like 35% of his threes. Um, yeah, they're still a contender. Even though they lost KCP, I don't think they're they're out of the question as long as Jokic and Murray has some semblance of health. Yeah, I mean, Jokic is so good that that team is going to win a ton of games. Yeah. I just look at the departures they've had. And, and Bruce Brown did not do really anything this last year. I but mean, he was, was in the wrong between, place. He was perfect for right, the Nuggets. Was, yeah. He was between Indiana and Toronto. And yeah. Just a, a totally different environment, especially from having someone like Jokic, who really was a great fit in terms of knowing how to deploy Bruce Brown as kind of this jack-of-all-trades, undersized power forward who could sort of play point guard, but not really. Yeah. Um I'm a fan. I like I like Bruce Brown's game, but as you said, they lost KCP. Adding Westbrook, interesting. I wonder if yeah, you can't re- really play him off ball. Mm-hmm. So there's some dynamics with him and say Aaron Gordon and Jokic, who obviously he can shoot, but you know he's not a, a high volume three point shooter by any means. And Russ can't shoot at all from deep. And Gordon can't really shoot. Yeah. yeah. But yet I'm kind of intrigued. So yeah. I'm like, maybe they can figure this out. Is Westbrook on the other side of an aging superstar where he's inexplicably still quick at age 35? Is he on the other side of the re- his own reflection where he's just like, I'm just going to be a free safety and just like let these guys be great. My role here is to be a locker room dude, a culture dude, an offensive rebounder, a deflections guy, and then if a windmill jam comes my way, take that. Like, I'm waiting for that version of him. I'm thinking of, like, hobbled Antonio McDice or, like, late Boris Diaw, just, like, doing the perfect thing for their team. That's probably the best way of looking at it. From, from all accounts, Westbrook is a great teammate. People yeah. really love him. That he's positive and funny and he's got people's back. And uh, again, he's, he's the best teammate. He's yeah. great. He's a great dude. He's down to scrap. Uh, he is a, uh, a marvelous teammate despite the fact that he is an inefficient chucker at points. Mm-hmm. These are two different things. Mm-hmm. How he plays does not make him a bad teammate. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I don't think anyone ever believes that Russ is doing this out of selfishness. It's that he just has a lot of confidence. Yeah, and, he's not done yet in his mind. And yo, know, he came off the bench. Yeah, and like, the, and this is this is yeah. a former MVP who yeah. averaged a triple double. He should have confidence. I agree. I agree. And you know, he took a step back last year already. So I, I think mm-hmm. the assumption is he's going to do the same. My question to you is: the Nuggets are a certain car they're kind of like a pickup truck he's a race car driver are the different cadences like is he chewing his tortilla chip not in sync sequence or in in sync with dogs barking (laughs) him being the dog maybe i don't know i'm i think rust still is explosive he can still pass the ball 
but he is a very specific style of player. Mm. And yeah, I don't know how he works in the half court necessarily, but maybe they're like, what if we took Aaron Gordon and he was a guard? I don't oh, know. Man, Jokic should probably that. figure this out. I wonder how much say Jokic has because he is the franchise. You know, it's the highest paid player ever. He spent his whole career there and there's no indication he's ever going to leave. But we also know that he famously seems to opt out and not care about basketball too much. In the off season, he's out. He's in Serbia, you know, putting horseshoes on. Raising his steeds. cats, reading novels. No, he seems like eating, a... Oh, eating stone fruit over the sink. He's a worldly dude, right? For sure. And I don't I don't think he has that 1990s Jordan originalist dog in him. But, you know, he's a champion. <laughs> he is... I don't even know if he's, he's worldly. He's just kind of a Serbian rube. Mostly he's wearing funny hats and, like, techno clubs. By definition, chilling in Denver for half your year and then dancing in minimal techno clubs in basements drinking weird bottled beers that's pretty worldly like look your Raya profile says you're bi-coastal yeah. Nicola so He's the a- fact that you're drinking plum brandy <laughs> over in <coughs> the bowels of Eastern Europe hey man that's sophistication but then he's in Denver eating raw steaks Michelob light cowboy hat no no more than one world is worldly. All you need is two worlds. Rocky Mountain Oysters? Have you ever had those? No, are they good? I don't know. I've never had them. But I'm, I'm sure they're fine. I mean, it's a mental hurdle. But they're like cut, sliced, and deep fried, right? I mean, that would be a sensible way of doing it versus whole. I mean, I've seen those gross out shows fear factor so yeah that those are pretty horrifying episodes but i shouldn't be horrified because they're beautiful creatures who give their lives to feed us they give their truck nuts <laughs> the, for our nourishment you eat those danglers um, fear is not a factor for you i guess what i'm getting to is before you you started fantasizing about truck nuts uh, is, truck nuts did you say truck nuts <laughs> Does he care about these decisions? Do they ask him and he like signs off? Like, all right, Nicola, we're going to bring in Russell Westbrook. And he says, hell yeah. Is he consulted? He must be, right? Uh, uh, he's he's it, the franchise. It depends. This is like a LeBron debate with Jeannie Buss. Apparently, he he's the GM. He's not the GM. They did this thing. He didn't know about it. Um, if I were in the room in the Denver Nuggets front office I would not care what Nikola Jokic has to say to your point it's like he'll be cool with us getting better I think any team adding Russell Westbrook would love it and fans would automatically hate it but he's a good teammate and any chaos agent is good for winning games when um, the Sixers signed Reggie Jackson, I think it's a veteran minimum. The oh, new sleepy time team. Yes. But my understanding is that was, he's friends with Paul George. They were teammates in L.A. They liked each other. Were they Sixers teammates like, okay. in OKC? No, not OKC. Reggie was a rookie on OKC, right? I want to say Reggie was gone by the time that yeah, Paul George got there. Yeah. I think he was already in Detroit at that point. Hmm. But they're cool. They're buddies. That's why he's there. And I, I, I'm not sure I like that sort of dynamic. Oh, are you gaslighting my team, bro? Is this a Villanova knock? I'm a little, I'm a little, uh, a little suspect of Too comfortable, the, the, you the say? friendship teams. Oh, God. All right, we'll give you six first-round picks. To get his college roommate on the squad. That's crazy. Okay, just a quick aside. Watching Devin Booker like do selfies on the Team USA yacht with LeBron. Is Are all those picks with McBride and Hart, does that get you Devin Booker? 
they're not playing the Suns are not playing for the the future. They're playing for the moment. But can you say no to that deal? <laughs> we'll give you a bunch right. of first round picks, Julius Randle and Miles McBride for Devin Booker. Or does it get you KD? I'm saying, right? It gets you a top tier Team USA player. I mean, no disrespect to Mikael Bridges, but goddamn. You know, it might be the biggest overpay I've ever seen. That doesn't mean that it won't work out for the Knicks. But when have we witnessed that many picks for a player that's never been an all-star? Dude, I gotta confess. I dropped $35 on Peaches on Saturday. 3 5 Insane. No sane person would do it. But I got what I wanted, so fuck you. I've been eating Peaches nonstop. Are you getting different kinds of peaches yes yes you getting the, From, so you get, you're getting the white peaches obviously um I'm, I'm so annoying i get white peaches from two different stands because they come oh from different God. trees and taste different and then i get the flat yes. ufo peaches that i don't love but my wife loves the flat ufo ones those are the ones that they kind of look like they've been stomped on yeah they're cute they're just not to me they're just not as scrumptious I don't know. Call me a hater. How are you on on nectarines? A little tart. The skin below the skin mm. is a little tart like a plum. Love them. The white nectarines are nice. But the fuzzy white peaches are the Rolls Royce. Mwah. Those are very good. Now, I have one final question on this topic because we've spoken about it so much. What's the difference between a crumble and a cobbler? I'm Asian, so I don't really know. But based off of my farmer's market aura, I don't know. Is it crust on the bottom? Is one like you... I th- uh, yeah, I don't know. I thought both only had crust on the top. But again, I could be wrong. I'm, I'm, I'm no hayseed. I didn't grow up with you know, pies cooling on my windowsill. You didn't grow up with like five brothers and sisters? Farming, day in day out, doing layup drills. Living the, the dream. Way. Yeah, a cobbler cooling on the windowsill and a rambunctious bear trying to get his hands on it. That's right, not the bear, just a bear. Okay, so back back to hoops talk. If you had five brothers and mm. sisters, would you want to be on the same team as them? And they're not the best players. They're not like Team USA players, but they're your homies. You went to Christian academies with them. You've been on teams with them. Do you want to? connect assemble the friendship family voltron as opposed to just getting the best player on the market well if you're one of those siblings sure there's there's the cachet and the comfort zone and you know sometimes you go to pick up ball and you'll go with your friend and there'll be someone else there who's with their friend and you'll generally try to put people on the same team oh you're with your boys okay so you two be on one team and, Thanasis, and add this person. That. and Yeah. yeah I, but so, of course, people want to play with their friends, and, and I get that. And the real question is, does it matter? Is there an advantage to mm-hmm. playing with your buddies? Yeah. Does it, is there a... Is it... I mean, look at the Golden State Warriors. It's like, well, they won titles with people who actively disliked each other. Look at the Lakers. It's like, does talent supersede friendship? Or, or a does having bad vibes eventually corrupt and toxify a championship team and then splinter it? Sadly, it's anecdotal and situational, right? Like, if skill sets complement each other and you guys are homies, cool. Yo, if Shaq and Kobe got along, I think they'd probably have more championships, right? Um Pow, famously good friends with Kobe, one of the rare people that Kobe got along with, maybe because Pow is a better player than he was. But that worked, and that was a good example of like a ha- happy, what, what is that sexist term? Happy player, happy life. You know, like if, if a team invested in you and you're like, okay, I have what it takes to win a chip, and you have a few roster spots, can you sign a garbage plate? 
just to make me happy because I'm on the road, you know, I'm, I'm lonely, I'm on buses, private planes. I don't necessarily love this, this Boston guy next to me, but he wins us games. Can I get my garbage plate to cuddle with, with the, my novel? I mean, that was the Jack Haley role for years. He was just Rodman's friend. And that was People important because Rodman was so... Him and, yeah, he was put, him, put him at the end of the roster. He never played except for garbage time, but his actual job was trying to keep Rodman sane and out yeah. of trouble. And there's talk of certain teams that like to draft players who love to play basketball. And that's kind of like subsided, but they used to talk about the Celtics that way. Like they just love dogs, right? But it's in the way that certain players are multitaskers on the court they pass they can shoot they can rebound they are cerebral they're fast whatever off the court it's the same thing like if you could sign an expensive player or trade for an expensive player that gets along with everybody who doesn't ask for their boys being like these guys that i just met they're fantastic i'm fans of them i'm a fan of the game we'll make this work like that's ideal instead of a player being like go get three of my boys I'm trying to think if LeBron is so elevated at, at, a, at a plateau that he's peerless where he gets that friendship kick from Clutch and from their integration into the Lakers' front office and the NBA itself. Right. I don't know too many players who are like LeBron's guy. Hmm. Like, you know, D, D- Wade... Mello, like he's friends with them. Chris Paul. I mean, he went to Miami, and he's like, "We're going to play together." But that seemed more about winning a title. Like, how many guys are there that sort of followed LeBron around? Like, okay, I'm going with LeBron here. I mean, Doc Rivers had his dudes. All right, here comes Big Baby. Here comes Paul Pierce. Does LeBron have NBA players who? I guess. uh, I guess Mike Miller. Might have been one, and then James mm-hmm. Jones? Well, I was going to say James Jones, but they kind of ascended to, like, real positions. I mean, James Jones ends up being a GM for a great franchise, well, a good team. And I think the LeBron effect is real, but as for teammates, like, this is kind of a hard general question to ask because it's clear AD loves him to death, right? Like, just his re-signing there Taco Tuesday um, them chumming around on Team USA together like they like each other uh, besides what Wade has said recently to muddy the banana boat chemistry like they like it Carmelo loves LeBron like players love LeBron but players following him around hard to really pinpoint mm-hmm. I, yeah I agree you heard the story recently that I, I was not aware of about LeBron saving Carmelo's life? Wait, what? This story has been told by both of them, and I I guess it's from a few years back, but they were on a boat, and I don't know if Melo decided to go swimming or jumped into the water or was knocked into the water or fell, but he ended up in the water, and he was struggling and, I guess, getting carried away from the boat, and LeBron dove in and saved him. Ah, well, that's crazy. That's crazy. Yeah, I, they've both told this story. I, I saw the clips of them describing this, and I think Le- Mello was talking about it on his podcast after this story was sort of resurfaced. And again, I don't think it was that recently, but you know, obviously it wasn't. You know, it was a, it was a while back, I believe. But and then LeBron was asked about it, and and he can't give him a roster spot on the Lakers. What the fuck, man? He can save him from the the tides of nature. But not just put him on the bench in Los Angeles? Get out of here, LeBron. There is no rescuing him from the march of time. <laughs> Apparently not. It's crazy how LeBron is still balling out. It is crazy. Yeah, he has this like patriarchal role. It's like the oldest guy in the league, the oldest guy in this team, like, uh oh, we're down to Sudan. Save us, LeBron. He's like, all right. Yeah. We drive in for a layup. Dinah Tarazi gave a quote 
said something recently that I thought was interesting. She was just like talking about Caitlin Clark. She's like, yo, I'm in my like zillionth Olympics. This is like my swan song. Since when am I the problem? Like, I'm still good. <laughs> like, we're going to do this. Why am I talking about Caitlin Clark? Like, should we not be talking about me? Is longevity a bad thing now? And I think about the LeBron versus MJ debate, if there is one, but there is on, on social media. The longer LeBron plays, the more Jordan originalists are like, but Jordan got it done in a shorter period of time. And I'm like, LeBron is still the best player on Team USA. That, to me, is astonishing. At this point, I, I find the Jordan still better things, like a little, it's forced. It's okay if you believe it, yeah. but you can't really argue it. It's, it's an odd point of, of departure right. to say, like, to me, MJ's still the GOAT. Right. That's great. Fair enough. Right. Some, someone may say, to me, it's, I don't know, it's Jeremy Lin. Jeremy Lin. Cool. Cool. That's that's your favorite player ever. You that t- like look, I will say Allen Iverson, goat. That's yeah. the goat. AI. Yeah. Someone on Twitter okay. was like, Magic Johnson's the goat. I'm like, fair enough. Enjoy cool. your player. Great player. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There's like no no issue with it. Keith, Keith Van Horn. Psh, facts. Facts only. Mm-hmm. Big facts. The Rizzler himself. Notorious KVH. Edge to KVH. Goon. Yeah. Do it. But, like, the MJ thing now feels just like a personal choice. Yeah. Totally. But there's not, like, a debate here. Like, you see what LeBron's doing at the same age when MJ was on the Wizards. Yeah. One last point that I wanted to make about the whole benching of Tatum. Or, or benching's the wrong term. He just didn't get in the game. Mm-hmm. They didn't say, you suck, Sid. No, he's going to start we have, next game. We have better options. Yeah. What I did enjoy was that for years now, we've, he's been on the first team, and right. LeBron and KD have been on the second team or third team. This concept of Tatum being better than them that was pushed by, of course, the, the BMM, the, the Boston Media Mafia, and they successfully got Tatum first team All-NBA ahead of guys who are clearly superior than him and always have been. And it's kind of nice to see a coach like Kerr being confronted with this decision of who to play. Do you take the first team all NBA guy? Or do you and put him on the court? Which includes or do you put, international players. And do, or do you put LeBron and KD on the court? He's like, what are you talking about? That's but, not a debate. But is that not pageantry? Is that not we're going to win anyway? And the representatives of our country are these guys. That may play a role in it, but it's pretty clear who's better. You put them all into the same context. And it's like, yes, LeBron and KD are way better than Jason Tatum. It's not saying Tatum is bad. He's a good player. All-star, good player. But when actually confronted by the decision and with real ramifications, who do you pick? Not difficult. I mean, if this was some soccer rules, I believe how this works. But like, can we rent Steph for one year or KD or LeBron to play in Boston in exchange for Tatum? That's an automatic chip. That's an so. Swiss Army knife of a good player. Those three, still at their advanced age, are devastatingly good. Tatum's nice. He is Alan good Houston, player. but better. Alan Houston was also on Team USA. So, like, the idea of Tatum fans being martyrs is complicated because he's been hoisted up to this level. It's like not all, all players do not matter. Like, you can't reverse discriminate against Tatum's game. Right. I saw people say, well, he can defend one through five. Mm, no, he cannot. can't. No, he cannot. What are, what, are we, what are we doing here? Luca went right by him. Jason Tatum is a decent defender. He's okay. He's, he's athletic. Big. He's yeah, big. He's big. I'm not even hating on him as a defender, but the concept of him is this hyper-versatile defender. No, he's not. He is maybe the fourth best defender in his own starting lineup. 
fifth best defender out of the top six on that team. They had to put together defenders around him. Yeah, good good player, but that's been the enjoyable part here is seeing that sort of mythology crumble in real time. But again, maybe it's short lived. Next game, Tatum's out there leading the team in scoring. Steve Kerr has got a you know got a, got many mouths to feed. You know, um, who, uh, what doesn't have many mouths to feed? You know who always feed your mouth? <laughs> cookies. Cookies. I love cookies.